Our guest this morning is Jeffrey Deaver, who is one of my dearest friends. I think you're among the first authors that I met when I, after I had become an author. And to tell you how, just how dear a friend he is, I have a birthday coming up at the end of this month, and, and Jeff came in from um, North Carolina to be with us. And he brought me, as my Christmas gift, or as my birthday gift, one half of the dictionary. <laughs> this is like A through K. It's this massive book. Uh, the Dictionary of the English Language, and it's written in the the old school where S's look like F's. Can you open the book up? And that's, let's see the, oh, look at that. Yeah, you got to know that, yeah. that shows on the air. It's about five inches thick. And he's a good enough friend that he brought it on an airplane for me. I mean, I that's, uh, how much that way? 10 pounds, I'm going to guess. When you set it down on the on the table, it made a thud. Yeah, it does. I'm, I'll, I'll put it over here. Yeah. But anyway, so, Jeff is a... <laughs> I think that, I think that, if you all heard that, yes. I think that went through to the basement. That's, that's a seismic. Somebody is recording that on a seismograph. Yeah. You introduced me as a New York Times bestselling author. Well, Jeff has, I don't know, you have 42 books, something like that, that's I'm out now? 49. Yeah. 49 books yeah. that are out now. And he, um, most recently... He uh, a new television show Tracker. You might have seen it promoted about a billion times. Great on, on CBS, um, just uh, premiered after the Super Bowl. Yeah, uh, interesting story on that actually. But before we get to that, Jeff, welcome to the show. Well, thank you all. It's great to be here again. So Tracker is a TV show that is based on your Coulter Shaw series. Correct. Yes. Tell us about Coulter Shaw. Okay, Coulter Shaw is uh, the opposite of a character many of your listeners and viewers might know, uh, Lincoln Rhyme from the Bone Collector show, uh, a TV series, and then the movie going back about 20 years now starring Denzel Washington and Angelina Jolie. Now, Lincoln Rhyme is a uh, forensic scientist, a brilliant CSI, Sherlock Holmes kind of fellow, but he's also quadriplegic. He was injured very badly in a, uh, uh, at a crime scene years ago. He doesn't get around much, obviously. He's brilliant, but he doesn't get around much. I wanted to do a character that was the opposite of that, that uh, went out into the uh, countryside like my heroes from the old westerns. You know, the spaghetti westerns, Clint Eastwood, uh, Shane, uh, an itinerant hero who would travel around, uh, save the day, and then ride off into the sunset. He rides off into the sunset uh, in a Winnebago camper and on a motorcycle. Uh, he does something that's a little unusual. He looks for rewards, um, you know, offered by, uh, of course, police, the authorities, also by individuals who've um, maybe found their daughters. But he's not a bounty uh, hunter. Missing. Not a bounty hunter. No, he doesn't go after people who've absconded on their bonds. Um, it, mostly he helps out civilians, you know, people who are distraught because uh, their daughters disappeared. And police, you know, this happens a lot. Teenager you know, runs away. The police just don't have the resources to get involved. Um, and generally, it is just a runaway, and the son or daughter comes back. But sometimes there are little questionable circumstances. And so Coulter jumps in his Winnebago, goes out, and uh, uh, as a, uh, you know, financial capitalist uh, 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 sort of soldier of fortune, he um, finds the uh, individual, makes the reward, and uh, drives off to next week's episode. And how many of the Culture Shaw books are out at this point? Oh, that's a good question. We've got uh, The Goodbye Man, um, The Never Game, and that's the one technically the series is based on. That was the first. Um, the Final Twist and Hunting Time. The reason I'm confused is that before I came here, I had my laptop up and I was writing the fifth Culture Shaw book. That's productive use of time. It is. It's desperation, I'll tell you. We have these things called deadlines, so... Uh, Oh, we've seen Mr. Gilstrap operate under his, yes. Yeah, get a little little crazy. So Wait, wait, wait. Where were you writing this at? At John's house? Um, yeah, John's house. Yeah. Ooh, he might be subject to tax. So, <laughs> we just covered that. Do we have a government official here? I wonder. But different county. If I <laughs> no, it was, it's a joke. Sorry. Sorry. No, no, I wouldn't worry about it. But, but then I guess I could deduct the cost of your mortgage. Right? There you go. Yeah. Please. Oh, I don't okay. pay your mortgage. Oh, okay. That was, I thought a, you were offering there. I said, you're on. <laughs> that would be a good deduction, yeah. I think. So as um, you carry a producer credit mm -hmm. on the TV series, so therefore you are intimately involved with the entire production, right? And uh, I know we're, we've got some video going on here, and I'm going to illustrate with my hands, and I will also then explain it, how involved I was in the making of the entire TV show, 13 episodes. And that's a zero, if anybody <laughs> can see that or wants to know. And, uh, you know, it's interesting. There's an author who uh, passed away not too long ago, Don Westlake, and you may have heard mm -hmm. him, John. Sure wrote a number of mysteries, a uh, great guy. And he had some absolutely abysmal movies made 
from his books. And a reporter was in his office and uh, asked the question, which many reporters ask us, what did you think about uh, the movie? Um, and, you know, the consensus was, oh, it wasn't that great. And the reporter said, well, what, what do you think about what Hollywood has done to your books? And he got this, he was a very big theatrical guy, and he got this horrified expression on his face and swung around in his swivel chair and looked up at his bookshelves. And he turned around and said, you scared the blank out of me. It hasn't done anything to my books. They're still there. Hollywood is, it's apples and oranges, two entirely different set of skills, uh, two entirely uh, uh, frameworks for uh, creating um, a product. We call them products, nothing wrong with that. Uh, we authors make books one way, movie makers and TV makers make their shows a different way. And so um, I don't want to be involved. I've got, I don't play well with others. You know, I, I want to sit down in a dark room, dogs at my feet and write. You make a TV show, that's a lot of work. You have to interact with people. And uh, now that this crew is a really good, this is a good group. And, and they're going to have opinions <laughs> that you have you to pretend it? to listen to. Can you, can you believe it? And actually, you know, writer, I know John has done some writing for, uh, on scripts and things like that. If you're in the writer's room for a show, you're at their beck and call. And, you know, theoretically, an actor is not able to change the script. He or she may come up with a great line, whereupon they look to the writer to put that line in, and it's kind of interesting, if you've ever seen a production script, every time there's a change, they use different color paper. So the I, I can only imagine something like The Godfather, a long movie, or any Michael Bay movie nowadays, with um, all the changes, it's probably the size of that dictionary and full of different colored, uh, colored sheets of paper. Anyway, I don't want to do that. I want to just get, get it done, sit down, and start writing again. I enjoy somebody who has a healthy disdain for those not in his, his uh, profession, <laughs> yeah. giving him advice on his profession. Yeah, <laughs> I, isn't that the truth? Yeah. I enjoy that healthy disdain you're, you're showing. That's pretty awesome. Hey, so uh, your books are everywhere. I was uh, at the supermarket with my wife the other day, and in the, in the book section of the supermarket, there's Jeffrey Deaver mm -hmm. books. Uh, that are there. Can you remember your very first time seeing one of your books, not in your house, not at the publisher's office, but you're just out somewhere and you see your book? Remember it exactly. <clears throat> I did my, uh, I dabbled a bit with horror because I read horror. I read a lot of genre fiction. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, I like Stephen King, um, I think V.C. Andrews. Um, I can't, this goes way back. I don't read it anymore. I read, but uh, you know, I started crying a little bit later. And I wrote a book called Voodoo, my first, very first book. And I remember, I was living in New York at the time, I went to a, you may not remember this, B. Dalton, a small mm -hmm. bookstore. Oh, yeah. Um, uh, connected with Brentano's and uh, other, affiliated with other bookstores. And uh, there it was on the shelf. Uh, just, there wasn't displayed, there was no promotion behind it, just the spine. And I got a thrill. And I'll tell you what, almost 50 books later, 100 short stories later, every time, I see a book either on a shelf or nowadays on Amazon, you know, the promotion, I get that same chill. It's just, it's just amazing. Right, John? You feel the same way. Oh, absolutely. Do you it's, remember your first moment, John? <clears throat> I, I do. And in my case, it was when Nathan's Run came out and I lived in Woodbridge and we had Crown Books then. And unlike Voodoo, there was a lot of promotion that went through Nathan's Run. And um, the entire window, uh, the, it was a, the outside window was nothing but Nathan's Run books that was that was pretty stunning actually that's, that's pretty neat then, uh, actually that was before probably cell phone cameras but did you get a picture of it you know I, if we did i don't have it i don't i don't know but it was, was it was fun. before cell phones yeah i've asked john this question uh jeff and i'll, I'll ask you as well uh we have a lot of local authors around here and if and we have them on the show and if if they write a book that sells uh, a thousand or two thousand books that's pretty good very good what what does what sends a book beyond that threshold to the point where it's a it's a new york times bestseller or an international bestseller well that's the the big question of course um there's a concept in this business called the big book and that's something you know i point to the da vinci code now dan brown had other successful books before that but that's the one that just took off and i, I can't explain it can you john there's a book that is people you know, the authors sit down, they want to write a book that will captivate the imagination, will sell well. Um, the same concept by two different authors of equal quality, one goes and one doesn't. It's, there's a magic element. There's lightning strikes and unicorn hair <clears throat> yeah. that's, that's involved in yeah. all of this. And then there are some books, Fifty Shades of Grey. There's no reason, there's certainly not, as I understand, I, you know, 
fairness, I didn't read it, but um, by it's it's an S and M book, right? And there's no reason that that should have been the runaway success that it was, but it was. It was a self published book, I, I and then it say, went it John, went crazy. I'm, I'm so naive. I thought yeah, S and M book. Well, I don't know that publisher. <laughs> <laughs> Simon and Morris. Yeah. It's <laughs> is it is it any easier in the age of social media to have a best selling book than it was previously? No, it's the opposite. Why? Because there's just like on TV, there's so many venues now. And uh, it's so easy to write a book. Uh, I teach a course in writing, and I'm, I'm pretty much of a taskmaster. And uh, I tell my students, you've got to outline the book, you've got to rewrite 30 or 40 times. Uh, you have to spend a lot of time thinking about the characters, uh, their stumbling blocks, the things you don't do. You, you look for uh, these, these pitfalls. And, um, you know, I uh, send the students out on their own. The big question comes up self publishing. And there are some bestseller lists which will accept self published books. Some of them are not bad, but I tell my students, you know, you you want to be traditionally published. That's the goal. You want to get into a publishing company because they promote, they spell check beyond your spell checking abilities. And um, so that's, um, uh, you know, th that's the proliferation of the creative product out there. And so now bestsellers are, lists are flooded. It's, it's tough to get on now, really tough. Matt Harvey. Jeffrey, uh, John failed to mention that in your pre previous life that you were an attorney. In, that's true, yes. Yeah. And so I guess like... In fact, your first book <laughs> was a law book. My first book was a law book. Yes, it was a guide for students. I like to teach, and it was a guide for uh, students, law, uh, the complete law school companion, still in print. And to have a book in print after 35 years almost 40 years, that's rare. Now I get, they don't send me a royalty check every six months, why? Because the publishing company has a policy that if the royalty amount is under a certain amount, like $100, they combine it with next year's check. Okay. So it doesn't sell a lot, but yes, that's true. I was an attorney and wrote a law book. So if our, our regular viewers ever thought, what would we get if we took John and Matt and combined them? <laughs> A mashup, yeah. huh? We, we, we have you, but um, how do you think that that profession prepared you to move into your next profession? Well, um, people say, well, Jeff, you, um, you write books about crime. You must have been a criminal lawyer when I was in New York. And I, I say, well, you draw your own conclusions. I represented large international banks. So was that criminal or not? Well, actually not. <laughs> At the time, this is you know, pre the meltdown, so uh, no, the, our clients were not nefarious. But I'll tell you what helped me. Two things. One, writing. Because law, as you know, is about precise communication. You get a word wrong in a brief, the judge sees that, and that could be the end of your case right there. Or send you back with your tail between your legs. And then research. Uh, law taught me how to research. And uh, because how much time do you spend in the library or your clerk spend in the library? Uh, I guess now it's computerized, right? Mm -hmm. Lexus, Nexus, or whatever. Um, but uh, that's, that's what helped me. And then I made a lot of friends and contacts, and I did meet criminal lawyers, and they were very helpful, too. Mr. Gilstrap. <clears throat> I, I wanna, when it comes down, I want to go back to, to Rob's question about w what makes a bestseller and what have you. Uh, Jeff, you, you're, you're going to blush, so I'll, I'll just say it. You are the master of, of the plot twist. Mm -hmm. That is your brand. <clears throat> yeah. And I think branding... Is, is an important concept within writing. So you write very tight mysteries, but particularly on the, the Lincoln Rhyme uh, mm -hmm. side of things. Not only are they, they tight, but they're detail-oriented. Nothing is ever as it seems, which takes a lot of planning, but you also combine it with very real, thought-out, and well-presented characters. Well, thank you. And that's, that's really hard to do, and not a lot of authors can do that well it's you know my my goal in this is to um uh, present my readers with what i read when i was a kid and those were you know agatha christie and sherlock holmes and i would get lost in those stories i can i can remember i, I had no talent for sports whatsoever i was the you know the it's nerd. a writer thing they, that <laughs> they would put me in i, I was so proud they say uh, deaver you know in, in school deaver first one picked Go to right field. Well, that's where you can do the least damage. I didn't know that. I thought right it was special. Yep. Yeah. And so I, uh, 
Uh, but that sense of excitement of losing yourself in a book, taking you away from your daily cares, learning things from books, but mostly it's the roller coaster, you know, a nonstop book. And so I spent a lot of time, a lot of time doing that. And occasionally I'll get a review or be on a panel where somebody says, you know, the question of, you know, literature and art versus commercial fiction comes up. And I say, well, you, you misunderstand. I'm not a writer. I'm not a novelist. Look at me like uh, David Blaine. Is that the magician? David Copperfield. I'm a magician. I'm an illusionist. You buy into one of my books for six hours of whipsaw uh, misdirection, and um, uh, at the end of the ride, you get off, and I don't kill my main characters. I don't hurt children. I don't hurt animals. Uh, the bad guys get their comeuppance. And readers walk away, I hope, with a smile on their face. That's this ama amazing emotional experience is what I strive for. It doesn't always happen, but that's what I go for. And you can only do that. It only works if you have good characters, both good and bad. I've asked John this question before, Jeffrey, and I'll ask you the same. How do you avoid, in 49 books, how do you avoid getting into a writing rut? Um, there's this old saw in Hollywood, uh, which is, is quite funny. When a producer is looking for a, uh, a product, and they call it product, as I did not too long ago, to turn into a movie, they want something that is completely original, completely original and yet has been wildly successful in the past. And that's Hollywood, and you kind of joke about it. It explains the, like the Marvel Universe, what are we up to, 185 movies now in that sequel upon sequel. Well, um, but it's a very good, very good question. And what you have to do is look at what you can recreate for, for readers in the next book. And um, so in other words, give them what they want, and yet do something different about it. So my theory behind that is that I give readers what they want. That's the twist that John was talking about. I have three surprise endings. You come to the end of my book, oh no, it's not the end. Ten pages later, there's another surprise. Ten pages after that, there's another twist. Um, and uh, so that, that's the roller coaster aspect that's always going to be there. But then I pick a different topic, uh, kind of a theme. For instance, my book, uh, The Broken Window, was about data mining. Before AI and data mining was a thing. Uh, the burning wire was about the fragility of the power grid, which is something that we, you know, we see now. Um, I dealt with um, undocumented immigration, and so those are all what we call hooks in the book. So people are going to get the roller coaster, and then they're going to think, so what else is Deaver going to come up with uh, that's new now? The la uh, most recent book, uh, Hunting Time, uh, they have portable nuclear reactors. I never knew such a thing existed. I mean, portable in the sense that I couldn't hook it behind my Pathfinder, but it's you know it's 90 tons. Helicopter can move it. I didn't know that existed. That's a big thing. And there's a big, you know, now a concern with somebody's going to steal it and turn it into a weapon. And you need a lot of them, but it can be done. So that was what Hunting Time was about. And uh, the new book is about, oh, yeah, I'm a suspense writer. I have to leave everybody in suspense. I can't talk about it. <laughs> Do you have a bank of go-to sources that you use to get the type of information you need to put your books in a different category? Well, probably like you, John, when I started, um, I would talk to the uh, police, prosecutors, um, and um, CIA. We know people in national intelligence. And then, um, you know, I might find a, um, uh, an individual who had a specialty, a surgeon maybe, that would help me. Nowadays, first of all, I've gotten lazier. Also, life is much more efficient now. Uh, the internet, this thing you may have heard of. And um, uh, that's where I go for most of my stuff. Now, if there's something completely obscure that I want to I want to use, well, then I will call somebody. But, I mean, do you talk to people? Do you hang out with cops like like we used to? I don't hang out with them. I call them a lot. Uh -huh. You know, that's the, the people love to talk about what they do. And not so much, I won't do it in, in terms of getting an answer to a specific question, but... Uh, like just came back from a shot show. So you sit down to an attorney with an attorney at lunch, random selection. And it turns out that he represents um, uh, self-defense shooting. He's with the oh, USCCA. Oh, his special. Oh, yeah, yeah his and that's, that's his specialty. It was a fascinating conversation. I have no idea if that's something I'll ever need, but I have his card, and I know that I can call him. He, he told me, you know, whenever you need some help, I, I found that, too. People love to talk about their things. And, of course, you and I know uh, people in the CIA and other intelligence agencies and you kind of wonder if that's uh, okay that's interesting but uh, are we getting a little close to where suddenly a red dot is going to appear on my forehead and that's it i'm gone because well, I've, I've learned some information maybe they're using you for 
misinformation or I'm disinformation. An I'm an asset. I'll bet that's what it is. I've always wanted to be an asset. They're, they're, they're putting the wrong stuff out there through your books. Yeah. And I wonder why, the, yeah, those, why that car out in front with the big antenna was pointed at my house. I wonder what, what that was about. Now you know. Yeah. White vans, baby. Yeah. Watch out for Oh, white vans. Got to be careful with those white vans. Jeffrey Deaver is our guest here on the program, along with uh, John Gilstrap and Matt Harvey. Uh, Jeff, do you get feedback from your books from people who are experts in certain subjects who say, oh, no, you got that detail wrong? Speaking of which, a few, <laughs> a few years ago, I got a, a book. I wrote a book called The Blue Nowhere, which was one of the first computer hacking books back in the 90s. And still quite popular, by the way, even though the hacker had to use dial-up <laughs> to remember that sound oh, of the yeah. modem, which I'm not going to recreate, but we all know it. <laughs> Very obnoxious. <laughs> completely obnoxious. And uh, so, um, again, plot twists and turns. And so I got a fan letter that went something like this. Dear Mr. Deaver, enjoyed your book immensely. Uh, the plotting was wonderful. The characters were great. However, <laughs> on page 132, I couldn't help but notice that you referred to, and I'm kind of making this, I can't remember it exactly. You referred to a Pentium, Pentium 236 processor in an Intel motherboard. As you know, that um, chip was not released until two years later. <laughs> this clearly was a clever clue to fool readers. I, however, didn't get it. Please change. I would suggest a footnote in your next edition of the book. And my, my thinking is, get a life. It was a typo. But you know what I did for like the eight geeks who wrote that to me? Um, I wrote them a personal letter of apology. Why? Because I had created, I myself had created something that was a speed bump that took them out of the emotional experience of the book. My fault, 100% my fault, can't blame the copy editors. Everything that goes into the book ultimately is on me. And um, I did, you know, that was pre Kindle books. So I did send a note to my editor and they changed it in future editions. But, um, you know, I get a lot of good feedback, but I really, I, I, I want that. I want to hear what people don't like about the book. It's all for them. They're, they're my audience. Dude, you should have taken the W. He thought that you did it on purpose. Yeah, that's I should, <laughs> so, how clever of you to see the plot. Now, if you can unravel this, I will send you a free copy of my next book. Hey, before we run out of time, we still have a bit of time left, but we do. What do you? What's the most recent thing that's out or is about to come out, other than the TV series, which is called Tracker, and it's very good. Oh, well, thank you very much. Yeah, I, I enjoyed the show. It was uh, on CBS again, on nine, airing nine o'clock on Sundays. Um, what am I working on now? Well, it's kind of a busy time. I have done my first co-writing project with a, a thriller author named Isabella Maldonado, and she and I have written a. Um, um, a thriller together featuring two new characters that we created. One was a, um, a Carmen Sanchez, and she is a um, um, works for a Department of Homeland Security, kind of their police division, Homeland Security Investigations. And another character, um, Jake Heron, who is an intrusionist, a term I made up, kind of like I made up the the uh, the tracker fellow. And he is someone who uh, is basically what they call a pen tester, penetration tester. And you hire him to see if your networks are secure and if your facilities are secure. And so he picks locks, he breaks in with the company's permission. And they, because of a crime that happens in the opening scene, they team up. And um, that will be published on Amazon uh, in uh, August. Uh, the title is Fatal Intrusion. Another Amazon project is called uh, The Rule of Threes, and that will be published in March. Uh, these are on Kindle, but also available on Thomas, in Thomas and Mercer hardcover books. The Rule of Threes is a novella. It's about 65,000 words. And uh, aren't you sorry you asked now? Because no! I could, that's uh, uh, shameless self-promotion, but... Um, that's what you're here for, man. Yeah, that's what I'm here for, yeah. These guys hear me whine about one deadline a year, and you're, and you're going on with, what, four or five competing well, deadlines? Well, a uh, book and a half, and then the short story. And I love short stories. You know, the, mm -hmm. uh, short fiction is, uh, if I could make a living doing it, I would. Do you have time to read anybody else during the course of a year, Jeffrey? There's a guy named Gilstrap. I read him. <laughs> that hack. Yeah. Um, I, I, really, I don't. And, you know, I'm 73. And, you know, age catches up with you. I'm not talking presidential politics. That's not, we're not going to go near that. Mm -hmm. But it does catch up with you. And my eyes are not great. I've got these kind of funky glasses on. And so reading is a chore. And I, I, I write eight, ten hours a day and I have to look at the screen. And thank goodness Word allows you to crank up the size of the letters to pretty soon it'll be the uh, two words on the screen. <laughs> Maybe not that bad. So in answer to your question, it's, it's kind of a chore for me to read. And also I'm uh, you know, I'm, I'm quite busy now. And the, I don't know, John, if you found this, but 
If you read somebody while you're writing, does their mannerism kind of slip into your writing? That happens to me some. I don't, I don't think so. I have a hard time reading a book because there's always a puppy on my lap. She yeah. does not like me to read. So yeah, um, I wonder what those teeth marks were in the books <laughs> exactly, on my bedside. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. Um, no, I don't read nearly as much as I used to because there's so much entertaining you know, elsewhere. I'm part of the problem yeah. of, of book sales. Well, I'll give the folks out there who are maybe aspiring writers um, one bit of advice, kind of apropos of this topic. When I finish all my copy editing, I, uh, I then uh, put the book on um, either on my computer or more likely my phone, and I have a program where it reads the book back to me. I think Microsoft Word does this too. I listen to every word, and I correct as I go along. And there may be typos I've missed, but... Um, it will vastly improve your product if you can stand to read whatever you've written, uh, have, have it read aloud to you. And uh, I've caught a lot of like substantive issues, like a character behaves one way in the beginning of the story and then a different way at the end. Well, we can't have that. And I catch that when, when we listen. How long does that take? Uh, well, it's like a book on tape, you know, okay. 13, 14 hours. It's, it's, you can kind of speed it up a little bit. But, you know, we're in a business that was originally completely oral. Mm -hmm. You know, people couldn't read. Literacy is a fairly new thing. And you think about the plays and the epic poems of the, well, going back to Greek days. Um, and so, you know, I kind of like to have a sonic quality. And you're quite a stylist. I mean, I read your books and I can hear that you've got a, kind of this, um, I, I don't know, poetic aspect to your, your style, which is very pleasing. And that's what I think... A lot of writers don't do. Jeffrey, I need a break to get into our final commercial um, stop here. So we'll be back with our final 50 seconds with author Jeffrey Deaver after these. Mr. Deaver, great to have you in studio. Wonderful to have you on the program again. I'm delighted to be here. It's always fun to be in a conversation with such professionals and fun guys. Johnny, just, you just sold end that on well. that. Just ended on that. <laughs> he sold it well, baby. Totally sold that one. I, and that sheet of paper you handed me that said that. It was, did I read it right? I put the type <laughs> nice and big. That was uh, the two, two words per page thing. Mr. Harvey, next yeah. week. Yes, sir. I'll be here. Mr. Gilstrap, tomorrow. Tomorrow. The Friday crew, uh, Ken Matson on the phone roll in place of Joseph Joey Toots Ferretti, who will not be able to make it. Uh, Dave Ramsey Show is next. This is Talk Radio, WRNR Martinsburg and TV 10. And we'll talk to you again in 22 short hours.